So my name is Pranav Tiwari. Uh, as uh, I was introduced uh, just now, I have been working with Google for the last two years, and uh, there's a few things that I wanted to share with you. Uh, at first, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for giving me uh, the opportunity to speak here. It's uh, really interesting and very exciting to see such a large group of uh, uh, energetic people working on Google technologies. And given that this is just the launch of GTUG in Bangalore, uh, it's very, very interesting to find a room full of people. So give an applause to yourself. So I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, a few perspectives on open platforms and uh, cloud computing, uh, which is really at the heart of a lot of what you are, you are doing today. <coughs> and <coughs> I'm going to offer some of my perspectives. <coughs> so. So what is cloud computing? And uh, to, to put it very simply, it's basically a set of applications and services uh, offered over the web uh, using connected networks, requiring no, no installations on your local machines, no uh, upgrades to your software, essentially delivered through a browser. And uh, all these applications, when, when they are streamed without requiring any kind of uh, special action on the part of the user, uh, essentially you're doing a lot of the computing in the cloud. Now, it's not a new concept. This has been around. In fact, uh, early forms of cl cloud computing that we know today uh, have been around for about 15 years in various forms. Not able to hear me? Is this better? Is this better? No. Better? No? No? Can you, can you take this back? Thank you. To make it very, very accessible to uh, By saying a lot of things that come together, I find the first two things like uh, network bandwidth is becoming accessible for everybody, uh, broadband becoming cheap enough, and uh, economically feasible enough for a very large number of people to, to start using it on a day-to-day -day basis for their lives. So the people, so the notion of computers has changed from what it used to be even 15 years ago, where it was an esoteric device where people would uh, do special things, to becoming a real part of our lives today. Uh, today, especially people who are exposed to computers, it's very hard to imagine them going without a full day. Uh, spending a good part of their time on it. And this change has brought about the accessibility of this cloud to everybody. And it's evolving so rapidly that it's impossible to imagine what cloud computing will be like in about 10 years from now. And the actions we take today, uh, the actions companies take today, the actions uh, developers, communities like you take today, and actions users take today will really determine the future. But one thing is for sure, the impact of cloud computing on our lives, on our families, the way we work, the way we entertain ourselves, is so profound that it's impossible to ignore today. It's, it's one, of the most, uh, one of the most profound innovations to come in the field of computing today, and it's probably going to be true for next decade. So with that background, I'll, I'll quickly uh, step into a little a brief background of how computing has evolved. Uh, in the days of the mainframe, we used to have, uh, so let's say, think of computing as four different dimensions. One is how much computation and storage it offers, uh, how accessible it is to everyone, in terms of applications, how easy they are to deploy, and what kind of functionality they offer. And in the days of the mainframe, this was this is what the uh, position looked like, where it was very strong and computation and storage. It had all the mainframes were very, very powerful machines given their days. Now, certainly they'll not be very powerful when comparing it to today, today's machines, but very powerful machines but not very accessible to everyone. And the applications were easy to deploy because you were deploying it in one location. Uh, one mainframe administrator would deploy the application and it's accessible to everybody who's touching the mainframe. <coughs> From there we went to the world of the personal computer where, again, the, the, it became very accessible. Everybody could have one of these personal computers at their home. However, the amount of computation power, the amount of uh, storage you could have on those personal computing machines were, was a lot smaller. Uh, at the same time, you, you, you made it very easily 
uh, sorry, very, very, very hard to deploy. Everybody had to manage their own machine. And clearly a group like you has no problem with something like that. But think of, uh, think of uh, an ordinary user who's not exposed to computing as a technology, but more, uh, more as, a, as, a, as a user. For them, uh, deploying a computer, managing a computer, managing a software upgrades, managing the antivirus uh, profiles, uh, upgrade of operating systems. This was a lot of work, and not a work, not, not the kind of productive work they would be looking for. Uh, they don't, most users don't care about such things. They would rather just use the applications and switch it off. But that, that's not how personal computers work. Uh, functionality certainly increased. You could do a lot more on the personal computer than you could on the main things. You could have personal document processing, spreadsheets. Uh, you could do presentations. You could communicate with your friends. All these things that were uh, not accessible and uh, easily available to all the users suddenly became available. And from there, we went to the world of the internet. And if I just think about what internet is today, uh, again, uh, amazing amount of computation power and storage. It's just point boggling. The, the number of servers that are currently serving all of us today uh, on, the, on the web is just mind boggling. Then the amount of storage that, is, that goes about in, in supporting our search requests and supporting our YouTube requests and supporting our uh, social networks, it's mind boggling. Uh, so, so really, I'm using a part of that computation and storage. But, uh, and, and again, is that storage all accessible to me? No. I cannot do everything I want to do with that storage. Uh, that storage has been designed by the, by the uh, application developers, and that's where it stays. So even though I have, I can, if, even though the storage and the computation does exist, uh, the, the, the use I can make from, from that storage is very limited. It's defined by what the application developers wanted me to do. Uh, it's very easy, easy to deploy. We've gone back to the same mode of mainframes again, where I build an application, I put it out on a server or a mainframe, yes, it's available to everyone. And it's available to a lot more people now, because web touches a lot more people now. And again, in terms of functionality, there's limited things I can do on that, because I'm limited by the access medium. The access medium primarily here is the web browser. So I can do everything I can do on a web browser, but beyond that, um, my, my hands are tied. Can I do voice recordings over this? There are limitations on what, the, what different standards allow me and what different standards don't. If the same application and the computation and storage was available to me on a PC, yes, I could do pretty much anything that I want to. So, so this is how things have evolved so far. And the change that needs to come about to make this cloud very, very, uh, a lot more powerful and a lot more relevant to everybody is something that we need to do here. Where we need to solve the accessibility problems, uh, things which are not accessible on the cloud. We need to solve those problems. We need to make it make the clients more powerful uh, by making the client, which is essentially the browser, more powerful. We'll be opening up doors for a lot more applications than uh, what is available today. And we need to make it pervasive. We can't say that uh, you need to be sitting in front of a computer to be doing anything, because the computer is not uh, the only medium through which these, these, these applications can be accessed. So make it more powerful, make it more pervasive, and make it more accessible. These are the three things that, that, would, that would determine how cloud computing evolves over the next, uh, next decade or so. Uh, <clears throat> why do we want to do this? Why does a successful company like Google want to, want to uh, worry about this? It's not just Google. Why does anyone want to uh, worry about open platforms? Uh, making a, basically creating a level playing field. And I, I recall a statement by Eric Schmidt, who is Google's CEO, which says that this industry, uh, the web, is going to evolve not as a monopoly, but as a partnership industry. The, the, and and, and that, that reflects very, very, very closely with how Google uh, is structured, with its culture, both in terms of being, being Favoring the open standards, favoring consensus-driven approach as opposed to a closed, closed-ended, uh, monopolistic approach. So, open web, web platforms essentially lead to richer apps, more powerful apps, people spending more time of their lives uh, doing productive things on the web, happier and more users, uh, and the larger usage always drives more revenue to Google. So, it's a very, very positive uh, reinforcement cycle for Google without having to either think only in terms of altruistic reasons or in terms of, so 
it's, it's very rare that your altruistic reasons and your profit motives are tied together, but that's the situation we are in. And happier users translate to uh, happier Google. And we do want the standards and the, the web platform to be completely open. So what do we need to do to make the client more powerful? What has Google done to make the client more powerful? Uh, if we think about where uh, web browsers were uh, about 10, I'm sorry? I have the slides, but you just tell me next time. Sorry, I just walked walk oh. back in time. So you can go Thanks. Is this? Yeah. I think I probably need some clients on this. Don't worry about I just popped up. I'll start using this, otherwise I'll use some exercise. So I'm sure a lot of you were around when the initial web browsers came about in, in the mid-90s. And I'm uh, not sure how brightly this is visible, but this is what a typical web browser looked like in 95. And this is what it, it appears like now. What is the difference? And the difference is, initially when the web evolved, a web browser was essentially a way to browse connected text and image documents. And that was the limitation. Uh, you could create doc HTML documents with linkages across, and that's what your web browser was. Uh, again, it, it sounds very simple today, but it introduced a very, very powerful notion at the time. And the powerful notion was, when I'm writing a small document, my document can have a lot, my, my document can be a lot more powerful than, than the knowledge that I, that I have about this subject right now. Think about it. If I'm writing about, let's say, a small cricket paragraph, and I know, I know what happened in today's game, and I can write about that. But for, to make this cricket paragraph, paragraph on today's cricket game very, very powerful, I can very easily cite, cite uh, other web pages and other documents people have created. And suddenly this one paragraph of text that I have written is almost a complete uh, index for anybody who wants to learn about cricket. I can take it to all the powerful uh, documents written about cricket. And so so the, the, the ability for a small, piece of knowledge to extend itself beyond that and present a complete information picture is something that, that wasn't there before. Yes, you could reference papers, but you also know that when you're reading a, a small article on the web or on the newspaper, it's impossible for anybody to find all the 30 references that are, uh, that are linked to that. But just this ability <coughs> to connect these documents together gives the power to each end user and, and it allows you and me and everybody else who's not an expert in a field to just create our snippet of expertise and link it to the plethora of information that, that exists around. So that, that, that's what the, the web browsers evolved to be and that's why they became popular. Um, very easy to create documents and very easy to share these documents and very easy to make these documents complete. And this aspect really exploded the usage of web browsers. Otherwise. From the perspective of a software application, a web browser is probably the simplest application you can think of compared to word processor and this and that. And look, look at the amount of usage that it's seen. And, and that transformed uh, over a period of uh, 95 to 2009 from being able to just look at doc connected documents to actually run applications. Today's web browsers do a lot more than just view, uh, viewing documents. You can have reasonably sophisticated uh, JavaScript applications built into the pages which are executed partly on the client side, partly on the server side. And with a combination, you can build very, very, very complex applications. Uh, and we'll go over uh, some of these applications as we uh, go further in the talk. But uh, this evolution has made the web, web browser very, very powerful. And this is essentially translated into how accessible uh, and uh, uh, powerful the web has become. Uh, and this needs to continue. Uh, there's, there's a lot more things that need to happen on in making this client uh, more powerful, but essentially it's a very, very good start. What has happened as a, during this uh, evolution is there are things like uh, very powerful JavaScript engines which have gone into uh, building the web browsers. There's uh, the web browsers, the architecture of the web browser has somewhat evolved from being a single application to uh, a multiprocessor system, which, is all, which almost looks like an operating system rather than just a browser. So 
let's talk briefly about Google Chrome. Uh, this is the browser I'm referring to when I'm talking about uh, powerful clients. And so the browsers were evolving at their own pace. Uh, there was uh, Internet Explorer and Firefox both had reasonable uh, audience. Uh, I think uh, uh, Google also had some uh, intellectual investment into Firefox and was contributing to Firefox. But it was very clear that uh, you need to redesign the architecture of the browser from start if you want to start thinking of these browsers as operating systems or browsers as a place to run applications rather than just a place to view documents and so what would happen if uh, if I want to think of an operating system, uh, it's very clear that uh, my applications should not interfere with each other. One application that goes down doesn't mean that my machine should go down. None of us likes that. Uh, so to, to fulfill our basically a lot of, to fill a lot of these gaps that existed between uh, the browsers and the needs for which these browsers were being used, Google basically started down the path of building Chrome. So how does it distinguish? I think these are three aspects that really distinguish Chrome from the, the direction in which the other browsers were evolving. Speed is important that it starts up like a flash. Uh, I don't want to click the button and keep waiting as it downloads a bunch of, uh, as it loads a large, uh, large libraries and large volumes of plugins and so on. It should start fast, it should uh, render pages very fast, and uh, it should basically make itself available to doing what is what the users want to do rather than uh, basically software upgrades, installations, uh, add plugins, this and that. Stable, uh, if I use, if I want to think of this browser as my primary mode of interaction with the computer, really I want this browser to be stable. If I'm running a dozen applications on this browser, starting from, uh, let's think, think of some business use cases. If I'm running my HR application and my uh, resume processing application, my uh, my dashboards, my uh, all, all sorts of that. One application misbehaving should not have any impact on on the rest of the world, and that's what the that that's the key differentiation that Chrome offers uh, by its multi-processor architecture. And again, uh, it also has implications on security because you want uh, the data to be completely isolated between between different applications and so on. So I want the browser to be fast, stable, and secure for these clients to be uh, to be very powerful. And of course, it has to be open source. Uh, it has to be open source because a uh, community of users can do a lot more than what a single company can. So Google has made this open source. Uh, in, uh, it has lots of advantages to the application developers. It has a fast JavaScript engine. Uh, Applications that you write for this are portable uh, to all other browsers. Better security, and, and it has a bunch of tools that the uh, that, that the application developers can use to uh, to develop them. What is the next step? Uh, clearly, there was an early announcement of uh, Google uh, Google's Chrome operating system. And Chrome operating system architecturally is very simple. It's a Linux kernel uh, running on the machine. On top of that, there's a very simple windowing system followed by a browser. And uh, this browser now acts like the, 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 the place where you run your, run your applications. And was it possible 15 years ago? No. It was not possible 15 years ago because of the way the browsers work. Also because of uh, what we used to think of the browsers, the, the applications available in the browsers. Today, the applications are fairly rich applications that you run on, on these browsers, uh, doing video chats, voice uh, calls, doing uh, email communication, calendar. Pretty much all the applications that most users have, certainly not all the users, but most users need, are available through these browsers. As a result, uh, you can start thinking of this browser as the key operating system where you want to run your, uh, run your applications. Netbooks are designed for such users. Netbooks are designed for users who are whose whose interaction with the computer is basically uh, about using these applications. And this seems like a very very ideal solution for netbooks. And so uh, this means uh, Chrome OS is going to be uh, web browser on OS. Is that much is there, or there's more to that? <coughs> so Chrome OS that's going to be released is uh, going to be. Uh, basically a platform where you will be able to write applications and run over them. 
and these applications will also run over uh, over standard web browsers. So when you're writing these applications, you will not need to think about Chrome OS as the only target. Uh, architecturally, architecturally, it has a Linux kernel. On top of that, there is a very simple windowing system with running this browser, which runs the application. The applications will be running over the browser. Okay. So we are not using anything like GNOME or KDE, anything like that. Uh, we are not using GNOME or KDE. It uses a simple windowing system for running these applications. It's running the browser. It's not GNOME and KDE. Uh, this will be made into an open source later on uh, after the initial development is done. And uh, uh, I think the, the contributions from the open source community will be uh, very, very important in its development. So why, why Chrome operating system? And why do we want to go on this path? Uh, clearly, speed matters uh, for a lot of people who don't use 90% of functionality of a computer. It will be a lot more important for them to power on their netbook or a sim simplified version of the computer and have everything available to them in the next 10 seconds. It should boot up very fast. It should allow me to access my key data, emails, web browsing, calendar, some of the basic things that I always use on the computer immediately uh, within, within seconds. It should not slow down with usage. Uh, most computers do for various reasons. Uh, it should be accessible wherever I am. Uh, so my data and applications should not be limited to me going and sitting in my study or in my office. Uh, it should be available to me any place I am. And so what is of value to the users? The users care most about the data and the applications. They don't care about what software is running on the machine how often he needs to manage that software or update that software. So the key focus for all the users is their data and their applications. And that's what this Chrome OS will, will allow them to access very, very uh, rapidly and in a secure way. As I said, this will be open source. Uh, it's not open source yet, but it will be, uh, it will be shared with, we'll be working with the open source community later this year. It will be available to consumers sometime in the second half of next year. Uh, the application, uh, all the applications that will be developed over Google Chrome will not require any special technology. Uh, we'll be using standard web technologies to build these applications, and they'll, be, they'll run across all browsers. So if you're not, as, a, as an application developer, you will not be locked into a particular vendor when developing the, the application. And that's really one of the key challenges both for application developers as well as for users. I hate it when, when I open my phone and I want to download one application from the web uh, and realize, oh, I can download it on my wife's phone, but I'm not, not on my phone. And it just bugs me. And so, so such problems just shouldn't happen. Users shouldn't need to deal with uh, problems like that. Uh, connectivity. Uh, let's talk about uh, the implication of connectivity in, in this conversation. The, the, the key thing about connectivity here is that it needs to be pervasive. Uh, I should not have to worry about where I'm sitting when I want to access my data. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of people keep, uh, a, lot of, a lot of you keep a lot of very important data on your computers and very often find yourself limited uh, or this, this piece of file or this piece of information is on my home machine, what do I do now? I often find myself calling my wife, okay, can you boot up the computer and check this and give it That shouldn't happen. I should be able to access my data all the time over any kind of device. Uh, a key thing here to note, especially in India, is that the number of mobile users is growing a lot more rapidly than the number of internet users. There's, there's, uh, the number of mobile users is uh, as high as 300 million now, and the number of internet users is still sub 40 million, 40 million now. It's not going to change dramatically. I think it needs to change, but it will, it will take time for this curve to reach anywhere near the green curve. The implications are quite significant, especially for everybody sitting here in India. The, the only device that 300 million people in India have today, which is capable of internet, accessing internet or applications over the internet, is their cell phone. Yes, these cell phones are very, very limited right now, but the way prices drop, Basically, every, every year, the prices of a cell phone drop by half. So you can imagine the cell phone, a powerful cell phone that I'm holding right now in my hand, uh, the price of that will be about a quarter in about two years. So 
So this cell phone will be available to pretty much everybody, every common person in India in about two years. Now, that also means that a lot of these people who are currently using the cell phone only for a voice call will have a device which is capable of accessing the internet. And they will, this, this capability will translate into real usage depending on a lot of factors. And one factor that we as a developer community can address is applications. There need to be applications which compel these users to start using this device for more than just, just voice calls. And these applications need to make a real difference to their lives. And that's when uh, that, that capability will translate into uh, spending money to get the data plan and actually using, using this. So as a result, uh, one thing that Google did here was investment in Android. And it was a very strong bet from Google's perspective, very large bet from Google's perspective to spend, uh, to spend resources on Android. And the purpose was uh, basically make the mobile internet an open platform. Uh, make the mobile internet uh, access pervasive. Um, so so there's, there are lots of things that are currently missing in today's uh, mobile internet experience. The browsers are very limited in their capability. That can be addressed. Uh, so that was one thing that we want to address. The, through technology, we want to be able to ensure better geolocation better uh, browser available on your mobile device. And again, over time, as data plans become cheaper, make, make these devices more powerful and accessible, uh, and, and these applications more accessible to everybody. Uh, <clears throat> innovation always gets scuttled when, uh, when there's no competition. Competition always spurs innovation. An open platform is a perfect catalyst for taking an industry which is bogged down with uh, with closed plat closed uh, ecosystems and, and throwing it open to the, to the community of developers. That's essentially what the goal of Android is, uh, drive investment in mobile software both from the perspective of large companies and also uh, groups of, uh, groups of uh, developers and development communities. And we don't want the users to be locked into any kind of, uh, any kind of one domain. Oh, I use X, Y, Z mobile, and half my data is uh, accessible through the through the applications developed by that. So my next one has to be uh, from from the same vendor. Now this kind of uh, locking mentality is something that has to go. So uh, basically, the goal is to make mobile application development an open platform and uh, uh, and then allow this for competition. And why did we give it away? Again, uh, as the goals that I stated earlier, to make mobile uh, application development an open platform, has a premise that this will be available to the open source community to develop. Uh, it's, it's basically, it's, so the, this is an interesting point. Is, so the kernel is not even hosted on Google uh, Google servers. It's available through kernel.org. And you, as any uh, developer, can go download it from there, make any modifications you want, start setting it along with phone. So Yahoo can download these today and build the Yahoo experience for them. They can work with any phone manufacturer and take the software and build the Yahoo experience, or Baidu can do that in China. Uh, there's a footnote here that I, I think we should probably not talk about Microsoft, because I'm sure they use Microsoft CE, but they're welcome to use this as well. So uh, the, the point here is that uh, it's not something that Google wants to hold. It's an open source effort, which is targeted to make mobile computing pervasive, mobile internet access pervasive. And as I said earlier, uh, the, the gains for Google as a corporation, which cannot be ignored from Google's perspective, come in a very indirect way. Uh, a, a wider usage of internet has indirect benefits to Google, even though it may not, have, it may not be directly tied to this. So we, we as a company don't need to worry about making money for the number of people who are currently working on this. Let's say it happens indirectly, and we don't, we are in a fortunate position where we can completely ignore that and go ahead along in worrying only about making this pervasive and open and uh, complicated. Let's talk briefly about the cloud. <coughs> so we talked about the client uh, and making it more powerful. We talked about connectivity and what would take to make make the web and the cloud accessible from anywhere or over any device. <clears throat> and what is this cloud itself? 
there's a lot of things you can do in the cloud today, and one of the biggest uh, reasons why it, it works is because of economy of scale. The kind of computing power you have in Google data centers is unparalleled. But the reason it is still affordable and scalable for Google is because of the number of, pe number of people who use it. And uh, for, for, an, for, for somebody, somebody to be able to replicate that kind of infrastructure and start a new application is extremely hard. If hundreds of thousands of servers offering a service to a set of users, unless you have the users already. So it's a, it's a kind of a cycle that, uh, that needs to be broken. You, you don't want uh, creative application developers to be scuttled because, uh, because hosting these applications requires such a large investment that they cannot even think of making that kind of, a, uh, building that kind of application. That's where cloud comes in, the, uh, comes in handy, and I'll go into that a little later. But this is an interesting graph. If you think about uh, Gmail, which is uh, basically a free email service, uh, and, but there, there is revenue associated with that because when you're reading your email, there is some advertisements that you show on the right-hand side, and some of, some of you thankfully click on those and generate revenue. But uh, uh, clearly that's not the goal. Uh, if it happens to be useful, you will click, otherwise you'll just ignore them. Uh, they're designed to be non-intrusive kind of advertisements. Uh, they're designed to be purely text-only advertisements so that uh, it's not flashing in your face and gives you a poor experience. Uh, so now, if you think about Gmail, as the number of users increases, the cost per user comes down dramatically, and that's purely because of economy of scale. Uh, similarly, as the number of users increases, the revenue also goes up because of various reasons. Uh, now, this is a very, very powerful uh, notion because What's happening is, as, as we grow the user base, the cost of cloud gets amortized, and you actually the applications start becoming more and more profitable, even though the initial uh, profits are very low. So, but but if I am an end, if I am uh, Pranav Tiwari and not a part of Google, and I have a really cool idea that I want to build an application over, I it's very hard for me to start here, when my Revenue is very low, and my, when my costs are very high. And how do we address that? One way to address that is by making the cloud open for everybody to develop applications on. We'll get to that in a minute. But uh, uh, let's talk about adoption of the cloud. And, and there are multiple aspects people think of when they are uh, looking at, uh, uh, I'm, ta I'm talking about businesses. I'm not talking about individual users. When, for, for businesses, there are many things that are important. <clears throat> Uh, one of the paramount things is security. Uh, let me defer that until I cover the remaining core, and I'll come back to security. So uh, I'm, I'm talking about an app, uh, an organization putting their emails on, on in the cloud or putting their key data in the cloud. And there, there's many things that need to be addressed before organizations make the leap from keeping the data in their data center from, and moving from, from, from there to the cloud. Uh, they need connectivity. They don't want to be uh, hampered by, uh, by basically not being able to connect to one data center uh, in accessing their data. If my business depends on <clears throat> information about all my customers, <clears throat> for me, it's very important to be able to get to that at any point of time. For me, it's very important to get to it from not just within my office, but also when I'm sitting outside the office. In fact, it's very important for me whether, whether or not I have internet connectivity, I should still be able to access this data. Otherwise, I don't want my business to be hurt because of any extraneous reasons. So connectivity and being able to access it offline is very, very critical to all the businesses. Reliability, when I want my data, I want my data. I don't want any excuses that, yo, oh, this network went down, or that, that happened, or this disk crashed. So it's, it's extremely critical for businesses to have the data reliably available to them, and user experience. I mean, all this contributes to user experience. But let's talk about security. That's one of the big... Uh, leaps of faith people have to make before they start thinking about their data being physically present in their device versus uh, uh, hosting it on the cloud. Now, there's a lot of comfort when one derives in, uh, in physical security. So when I'm holding my laptop like this, I know it's there. It's there with me. All the data that I have in my laptop, it's in my hands. Nobody can take it away from me. But let's consider some of the facts. About 10% of the laptops get stolen in the first year of their life, uh, first year after being purchased. About, so that basically means about 2 million laptops get stolen every year. 
about 60% of the data, 60% of corporate data resides on unprotected desktops and laptops. Now that's huge. Basically what we're talking about is about 60% of data uh, is at the risk of being stolen uh, and about 10% in the, in, in, every year. And, and there's a lot of business information that exists in that data that is at risk. That's a very, very threatening scenario. Uh, and and I, I don't think any, any of the businesses really want to, uh, I'm not sure how many people understand that, but when people, whenever people think about security on the cloud, they try, try to compare it with physical security, which they are comfortable with, versus putting, it some, putting some data on the cloud. And that's something that's beyond their control. So this perception of security versus real security is, a, is, is one thing, but yeah. Uh, so that, uh, still a lot of people are apprehensive, basically because they are not yet comfortable that data is very, very secure there. Some people have made that leap of faith, and other people are in the process, and many have not done that yet. Uh, but one, one still needs to remember that uh, the security cloud offers uh, is a different notion of security. It's not physical security, but uh, the, the kind of uh, security that gets uh, ignored is at least uh, some, uh, something to think about. So Google App Engine, I think there's a talk later on where, which will go over Google App Engine. So I'll briefly talk about it. Uh, remember the graph about uh, uh, number of users as they increase? The, the cost per user goes down and the revenue goes up. Now, I, as an individual user, cannot start at this uh, cost versus revenue graph and wait for this to kind of uh, make the turnaround over the years. How do I, how do I make sure that uh, every individual user has the ability to leverage what has already been built? And that's what App Engine addresses. So basically, it provides a very, very scalable infrastructure where you can build your applications, host it on Google's infrastructure, retain the rights of this application. Google does not take any rights over these applications. Allows you to monetize these applications uh, depending on how many users come and view this. And a very large number of, uh, uh, a, a very large amount of traffic can come free to you. You can have five million users, uh, five, million, five million page views per month without having to pay a dime to Google. And that's a, that's a very, very uh, powerful infrastructure for anybody to experiment with. A lot of the experiments fail. Some of them click, and when they click, you can you have you're free to still decide whether to continue hosting it here, build your own website. Once you've proven a concept, it's a lot easier to take it to a VC or for any kind of uh, funding. So the the, the idea is that uh, you have uh, a very strong platform using which you can, uh, which gives you all the all the redundancy, all the load balancing, all the data centers across the world that are available to you to build these applications, host them, and uh, take them to the, to the user without having to worry about uh, the hosting costs, managing cost, having to raise money up front, except for, so the only thing that's needed is a cool idea and a passionate people, a set of passionate people to work on it. Uh, the web is social. Uh, there are other social networks like my phone book, my email address book, but, but what's the idea of open social? Why did Google go about doing open social when Google already had Orkut? And again, the, the, the theme here is openness. Uh, when, I, when I have a social network, I don't want it to be limited to the one social networking application that I'm using. Uh, the idea here is to essentially allow any user to access their friend network, their, uh, their, uh, their social network through any kind of application. It could be embedded in my web page, my blog, my uh, customer relations website. Uh, so essentially opening the social networks through an API to be embedded into any kind of an application. So this is one of the things that is very, very close to everybody sitting in this room, which is uh, the availability of uh, non-English documents or non-English content uh, to Indian users. And this graph speaks for itself. There's, there are 7% people who are English speakers in India, and the remaining 93% people uh, prefer to speak in some other language. And while they, and so it essentially it rules out web from a very large part of our country. Uh, given the small number of documents 
and applications that are available on the web in non-English, non uh, Hindi or Kannada or Tamil, there's, there's so little content available that uh, there's very little reason for this 93% people to even think about going to the web. How do we solve this problem? And the way to solve this problem is by making more, more and more Indic content, non-English content, available, and not, not, not just content, non-English applications available over the internet. And I'm not sure how many of you have uh, tried to use the transliteration and translation APIs Google has. These are built into some of Google's applications. For example, you can go to Gmail and type in uh, the language of your choice, uh, Hindi and a few others. Excuse me. Uh, so it, it would take the English text you are typing and transliterate that into Hindi or uh, your, the language of your choice. Uh, you can do the same with the translation APIs. And what needs to happen is these to become <clears throat> more and more the part of application development and people to start thinking about developing applications not just for the 7% but for the 100% uh, target audience. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a cycle that feeds on itself. Uh, there are, there's not enough English content, so there's not enough uh, Indic users on the web, and vice versa. And th there's not enough Indic users. For a new person, it's very hard to build applications or justify the cost of building applications in Indic languages. But the cycle needs to be broken. And uh, from, from Google's part, the way to help that break is by exposing APIs to translate, transliterate, and build it into your applications. So I'm going to talk about one application that is very close to me. Uh, it's close to me because it was, uh, it was done right here in this building. And I was a part of that. Uh, the reason it's also very, very critical to this audience, very, very interesting to this audience is because of uh, the fact that it's built using a large part of Maps open APIs. It's built using, uh, so the whole notion is by uh, building a lot of data using a community rather than uh, a set of uh, dedicated people, so Maps. Um, they are very important uh, in terms of uh, in terms of what they can be used for. So, human mind organizes information in many ways. Uh, it organizes that chronologically, or it organizes that spatially. And when you think about maps, maps is really uh, maps are really a way of organizing information in a spatial or geographical fashion. And there's a lot of studies that have uh, gone on to say how much impact high quality maps can have, not just on, on what you do for looking at directions to a pizza place, but also on the GDP of a country. There are studies which suggest that the GDP of a country can increase by 1% just by having really, really high quality precise maps. Uh, think about that for India. I mean, uh, not having these maps can live. And, and the, it, the, the impact is very, very indirect. The impact happens when people are doing planning, when people are thinking of where to build roads, when people are thinking about which areas need to be connected by trains or bridges and this and that. But the impact does happen. Uh, and having precise, high-quality maps has a huge impact on, on a country's economy. Now, let's, uh, let's consider a couple of facts. Most of, most of the lives that we lead, and even more so, most of the lives people who are not in the same technology sphere as you are lead, they are very local. 80% of money that people spent is spent within 20 miles of where they live. About 90, sorry, about 80% people don't ever go beyond the 20 mile circle of their birthplace. So the local information is extremely critical to people. And that's again where maps impact our lives a lot. If I live in a small village near Tumkur, I don't care about the maps of Bangalore. What's relevant to me is the real map of the place where I live. I want to see every farm, every tube well, every uh, person who can rent a tractor to me available to me on the map. And if it's not there, that map is completely meaningless to me. So the local information in, in utmost detail has a critical, profound impact on our lives. And that's something that uh, uh, I realized once I got involved in this project. <coughs> and this is something that had, <coughs> that had driven a couple of people in this uh, office to start thinking about maps and uh, basically building maps for uh, places beyond, beyond the Western world. So I'll, I'll show you a couple of graphics and uh, try to explain what I mean. Uh, let's look at this. This is Singapore, a few square kilometers, or a few square miles of Singapore. And this is 
does it look like a city? It doesn't. It's Khartoum, which is the capital of Sudan. And if I show you the satellite image of these, these two places, they both have, I mean, the, the buildings are not as pretty, but still people live there. There are roads there. But this is what it appears on the map today. You see one highway crossing over, another highway crossing over. And this highway is very badly misplaced, maybe by several miles. But again, this is the map of Khartoum we have in the world today. And this is the map of uh, Singapore. And why? The reason is that uh, for me as a company, as somebody who's, uh, again, uh, if, I'm, if I'm a company, I have profit motives. I need to think about how I can do work and get money in return. For me to be able to generate this data, I can monetize this data. I can make money off of this data by licensing it to Google, by licensing it to GPS providers, by licensing it to Yahoo. But if I go and uh, build detailed maps of Khartoum, there are hardly any takers. Or even if there are takers, the amount of money I will get in, the, in return for that effort is near, nearly zero. So, so we are again in a cycle where maps are important for this place, for their local economies, but this will never get filled up. And this is the challenge that drove uh, a few engineers in this office to start thinking about how can I make this look like this? Maybe not exactly like this, but again, it have just as much detail as you find here. And the way to solve that challenge was to again start thinking about using all the Google technologies, APIs, and much more than that, the crowd. So the mission was we want to build a geo web for India, extend it to the world. We started by looking at India as a problem. India looked exactly like the right-hand graphic that I just showed you, not much different from that about two and a half years back. And it has changed quite significantly since then. And a large part of that is because of this effort. The technologies available to us are Maps API, all the satellite imagery that Google provides, GPS overlays. We want to leverage uh, the huge cloud computing infrastructure Google, Google has for doing the computations, graph synthesis, and so on. Again, I'm sure a lot of you do realize that uh, maps are one of the most complex graphs uh, for any kind of graph theoretic problem that one thinks of in computer science. Uh, each small lane is essentially a, an edge of that graph. And again, it's a hierarchical graph, which uh, you need to think, think in terms of basically all the computer science problems that you think about. They, they completely change their scale once you start thinking about applying those problems in, in the context of the graphs formed by uh, maps. We also need to make sure that there's no spam in this. I don't want uh, a spam in a blog is annoying. A spam in a map, which leads me to a dead end road, is, is annoying, but much worse. A spam which marks a one-way street in the wrong direction can be fatal. So we need to prevent <coughs> spam here. The, so using these technologies, we want to empower users to participate in the experience of maps creation. And of course, you know best. You know the best about your neighborhood. You know the most about your street, which Chota Pan Dukan is there, which small Kiryana store is there. These are in, this is information that uh, large companies cannot gather. So empower users to mark each small and large feature on the map, put all the small businesses on the map, put all these small businesses accessible to everybody so that they are able to play in a level field when people search for information. If I, am a, if I want to start a small business which uh, keeps track of the drivers in this area and I'm going to provide a driver on call, I should be able to uh, put myself on the map and be play as a living, level field uh, rather than having to advertise quite, quite significantly. And of course, after all this, expose all this information that we have as APIs. Just like Maps API gives you the map styles and maps uh, satellite imagery, we want to create the, expose the tiles created by this effort uh, to, to the develop, uh, community of developers to, to start building more applications around this. So what happened as a result? Uh, is this visible at all or not? <coughs> I want to give this as an example of what, what is possible with this effort. This was Myanmar the day the cyclone hit about a year, and a year, year ago. I think last year was the time when a big cyclone hit <coughs> Myanmar. Lots of people were uprooted from their homes. Basically, when relief agencies 
uh, got got mobilized, they realized that they have no way to find out where villages are, where relief centers are, where how to get to hospitals. Absolutely no information. The information, whatever information they had, was very very patchy uh, through small exchanges. And then, if one agency gets some information about hospitals, there's no way for them to communicate that to the other relief agencies. And uh, it was it was a huge problem uh, because without such in, such information, how do you expect? somebody from uh, India going as a part of the relief effort to Myanmar to be able to navigate and get to the right places where people need help. It was impossible. So we, uh, so the mapmaker team took it as a challenge and said that we'll fill this place with all the information we can derive and create the maps. And within, within less than two weeks, the, this area looked like this. All the hospitals, all the schools, all the government infrastructure places, Every information we could gather about that was marked on this map. All the roads, highways, everything was filled in. And it took about uh, transformation about two weeks or so for this to be published on Google Maps. Now, that is power that affects human life. And this is the power that MapMaker builds and exposes that to end users. Uh, I want to show a small clip if it works. Watch the date, 30th June. These are end users sitting in their homes, labeling these streets, filling up the rest of the map. 26th July. This is a city in Cyprus, Nicosia. And I would like to see this basically start from scratch and essentially become evolve into a full map. There are lots of changes happening. People are basically uh, adding names and then changing them later on, filling in more details about those streets. <coughs> So this is Karachi. This is what Karachi looked like the day we launched MapMaker in Pakistan. Maps are much more than just roads. No, I mean the MapMaker allows you yeah, to Yeah, yeah. I was getting that. So maps essentially, so there are some basic elements like uh, roads, uh, geographical boundaries like states, cities, neighborhoods, and businesses. But a complete map contains a lot more. On a complete map, I would like to see every geographical feature I can see visibly on the on the on the earth. <clears throat> so today with MapMaker you can start with uh, so the national boundaries are pre-created. We don't want people to be tinkering with national boundaries because that leads to unnecessary uh, confusions. Uh, you can draw villages, states, uh, cities. Draw boundaries for each of these. You can draw map uh, roads, lakes. It's it's very interesting if you just look at the uh, a map containing only roads for Bangalore, you will not recognize the city. The moment you place the lakes, oh, yeah, this is Bangalore. I know this place. So it allows you, you have to create lakes, uh, uh, polygons for large buildings. Uh, it allows you to create farms and mark them as farms. Basically, any kind of information that you would like to see on the map, it should be there on MapMaker. Have you tried using it? No, I haven't tried it. I have tried the map too many times, I believe. <coughs> the other thing I wanted to ask is how, how are we making sure that the the road that is placed in a certain uh, I mean area is precisely to that uh, GPS location or something. Okay. Can so, so the canvas it, pre it presents to you is the satellite imagery. So, um, what I was showing you was just the map overlay, but you can enable the satellite imagery as a background. On the satellite imagery, you can visually see the road, and then you can draw using your using the toolbar provided. So there are there is some validation to prevent uh, obvious use obvious misuse things like uh, addition of inappropriate words, but uh, it's again uh, in true uh, true uh, true open platform sense, the validation happens by users. So each user, as you start entering more and more valid data, you gain trust in the system and you become kind of a moderator. So you are able to uh, validate things that are other people are contributing. So again, Yes, you can delete other people's data. And if you have enough trust in the system, your deletion will be effective immediately. But to gain that trust, you need to have spent enough time contributing good data. Uh, so there is potential for spam, and there's lots of mitigation methods built into the system. So a new user, when he comes in, is starts from scratch. He doesn't have much trust in the system yet. Every edit he makes goes into the other community of uh, users in that area, the ones which are uh, which have enough trust in the system, they start uh, 
uh, they start moderating their edits and slowly you gain trust. Uh, there's one more thing I uh, was uh, thinking about. Is there a freeze time that says that, okay, this is a national highway or something and nobody can change this? So for example, if I become a trust user over a period of time, purposely I became a trust user maybe uh, just for hacking the system down and uh, maybe suddenly I remove all the national highways after I become a trust user after a month or something. So is, is it something like Google freezes down that these are the areas that we know and confirm kind of a thing and now people can't change it or something? I mean, we don't, just a thing we, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that because things change. Things never freeze. National highways do change. So, Secondly, uh, the one key thing is that the more important a feature is, the more people are interested in that feature. So you could spend months getting enough trust level that you can uh, you can deface one of the national highways. But very quickly, another user will fix that. At the same time, the months you spend gaining that level of trust is immediately gone once you caught spamming. Yeah. So yes, uh, defacing is possible, just like any user-generated content. Defacing is possible on Wikipedia. You can go and edit things and, yeah. but the, the if this is a very, very sophisticated trust model, and in this trust model, uh, the, the penalty for defacing is very high, and the, the threshold for somebody to become trusted uh, takes a very long time to build. So the amount of spam one can contribute is very limited. Is this, uh, I think that this Wikimapia, I'm sorry? There is a Wikimapia.org, right? Wikimapia uses uh, Google Maps styles already. So if Wikimapia chooses, they can show these styles on their site as well. So does the government help uh, uh, fixing the maps up by uh, changing the direction? So for example, I come on this road today, and the next day I come, suddenly it's a one way. I mean, that's a simple thing in Bangalore. Huh? So does the government help to uh, do any of these things, or it is completely on the users? It, it can help. But uh, my experience uh, says that uh, it's a lot quicker to get it fixed by users than by government. Yeah. <laughs> I think a lot more users travel on that road. And if it is an important enough road, one of those will go and fix it once he goes to the office. So th th these are a couple of examples I wanted to share, which essentially try to fix the divide, and fix the map divide that I initially showed you by comparing Singapore and uh, Khartoum. And uh, this is our effort. Uh, the reason I think it's very relevant to this community is because it leverages the power of the cloud. It leverages the power of the crowds. Essentially, it uses crowdsourcing for building a very, very rich and important data set. Uh, and that's the kind of application that I think that would really transform the web over the next 10 years. That's, it, it makes maps available to every single person in India. And this is a data set. This is an asset that is, accessible, that is meaningful to all the 93% we talked about. There needs to be 10 more of these data sets that compel those 93% to start thinking about web as a part of their lives. And that's what uh, I'm going to throw as a challenge to each person sitting here. There's a lot of information that is currently being generated, which is of meaning to the 93%. It's just that it's not accessible to them today. There's a lot of political information, like uh, the minutes of Lok Sabha. Uh, there's a lot of transparency-related information, like uh, the information from RTI Act, the information about uh, uh, basically uh, uh, census, ele uh, election commission. Each of these pieces of information uh, pieces of information matters to me. There's information about uh, property taxes in my area. I, 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 the information about how much my neighbor paid as a property tax is available if you want to go and uh, ask for that information. But how many people? And it, it's relevant too. It's relevant to find out who's uh, basically making everything accessible goes halfway in making uh, preventing misuse. If I know that my neighbor is paying three rupees as a property tax in his self assessment scheme, if the neighbor knows that this information is going to be available to everybody, he's, think, he's going to think twice before stealing that tax. So there are opportunities in terms of transparency. There are opportunities in terms of breaking the information barrier where I would like to say what my MP went and said in the Lok Sabha. I would like to say, I would like to find out 
how much money did he get allocated for my constituency and that did not get spent. I would like to see what money was allocated for the street next to my house, which has not been repaired for the last, last three years. And this information is available, but not organized. And the applications that we as a community, and uh, it's not something that Google alone can do, it's the application that we as a community build can help in exposing this kind of information, making it available, accessible to everybody. <clears throat> Google's mission is about organizing all of the world's data and making it accessible to everybody. And that everybody includes the 93%, not just the 7%. That's on, on the internet. So we need to think about what data is meaningful to every single person in the world, every single person in India, because if we start thinking uh, locally where we can make a larger impact, you know the problems that you have faced growing up, and you know the problems you face today. You know the problems these 93% face, and we need to figure out how we fix the problems of these 93% with the tools that we have. Clearly, we will not fix all the problems, but we have tools which can fix a lot of these problems, and uh, we need to be working on those. As a <clears throat> so as I mentioned, I think we need to democratize uh, application development, where it's not just Google who's building the applications, it's everybody. And these applications are being built for everybody. These are built, being built for the 7% elite who currently have access to the internet. We need to make data transparent. We need to make all types of useful information available to everybody. We need to build an inclusive web. We think about uh, seven, a large number of people in India being on the internet. I also think about 1 billion people in India not on the internet. And that's a very, very strong statement for us to think about. So as the web evolves over the next 10 years, these are the people who also need to be addressed. Last thoughts. Uh, this is an interesting. <laughs> that I saw somewhere. Well, I didn't see it. I saw a picture of it, but I thought this is very relevant. Clearly, we need to answer a lot of these questions together as a community. Uh, and Google is very happy to expose the infrastructure and the APIs, which make development of these applications very easy. So the platform, the web, the way it is evolving, it's, it's our web. It's our platform. And we should all be leveraging this together for building applications and deriving value from that. Uh, the, we need to make more powerful clients which make the power of, which expose the power of this web. Businesses need to think about their customers, users, employees as the cloud generation. They cannot keep thinking about the world that they come from because a lot of the people who they are employing now, a lot of the people to whom they are selling now, they are the cloud generation. So when I go, when I as a customer go and buy something from a business, if, uh, not, not the small thing, let's say I buy a large piece of uh, $10,000 camera, if, that, if I cannot get support over the, uh, of this over the cloud, if I cannot get uh, uh, firmware upgrades over the cloud, it will be a very, very poor experience to me. Because businesses need to think about cloud as an essential part of their business, both for keeping data and also for interacting with their customers. And security. I mean, I talked about security a little bit earlier about perceived security and the real security, but it's really a uh, it's really a component that uh, both the developer community and the businesses need to think about when, uh, in a slightly different way when they think about the cloud. It's, it provides you the kind of security that wasn't available earlier. It doesn't give you the physical security, but at the same time, if you you need to consider all the all the aspects of security when you think of secure data. I think with that, I'll probably take a few questions and uh, not take any more time, uh, because I know that you have a packed schedule ahead of you. So if you have any questions, I'll uh, try to answer them now and then hand it over. Yeah, just well, there were a couple of questions I had. Like, first thing is the uh, revenue target blitz I find there are a lot of uh, cloud vendors out there. So what is kind of bottom line revenue? Let's say maybe our projections are there. Maybe somebody can compare, let's say, five years down the line. This is what the cloud was all about. Maybe people thought that it would be this big, maybe for, for the large players, and then how it was big. So are there any revenue projections what Google has? And second thing was, like, what, what's the perspective on the private clouds? Uh, what uh, quite a few companies are considering. So what is Google's uh, perspective on that? So, Google doesn't think of cloud as a separate part of its revenue. 
Google thinks of its revenue as uh, something that's going to be driven primarily by internet usage. And cloud is one of the ways through which internet usage is going to be spurred. We don't attach any revenue target for the cloud. Uh, we basically have, uh, we're using, we are thinking of cloud and open platforms as a way of spurring growth of uh, these platforms and making them more pervasive. Uh, regarding the second part where uh, there's private cloud, uh, I think as long as it still talks about open internet, open platforms, and open development, uh, it's, it's, it's a fair game. You don't have to use Google's cloud if something else makes more sense for you. These are just tools available to the developer community where you can sandbox your applications, play with your applications, expose it to the users at no cost to you. And if it works for you, you, you may decide to build your own data center. You may not even think of Google as the data center where you want to host this. If you become as large as um, Twitter, Twitter could have started on one of, the, one of Google's thing, and if they become big enough and they believe that they can sustain themselves better by building their own data centers, perfect. I think uh, uh, one thing probably which I did not come across very clearly on is from our perspective, it's the open platform and competition and uh, quality of applications that <coughs> benefits Google the most. And thankfully, that also benefits the consumers the most. It's good to be in a situation where what's good for the users is also good for you. Then you can start think, thinking good. You don't need to think about mischievous ways of making money. Isn't there a budget approval like what Google goes to? Maybe the amount of dollars you invest on building such uh, available infrastructure? Absolutely, absolutely. When, when Google thinks of any new product or project, you always need to justify why you should be doing that project. And when you think about very, very large efforts like Chrome and Android, these are very huge efforts. These are efforts which have, I would say, comparable to the largest projects that Google has done. But the reason to invest in that is because, yes, they, they do not have any direct revenue tied to them, but there's an indirect revenue. And that's always been true with a lot of what Google has done. Search does not have any direct revenue attached to it. There is no direct revenue attached to search, but search is probably the most important thing Google does. And the reason it does, so there's, there's one part of Google which builds search and refines search and makes sure that it's doing the right thing. There's another part of Google which says, okay, now that we have high quality search and a very large number of users coming to search, let's figure out how to make money from that. These are two separate efforts. How about hosting services, they're going to be free of cost? Google apps are free, and that's a hosting service at this point. Uh, the app engine is free, uh, up to 5 million users, uh, sorry, 5 million page views a month, which is a very, very large volume for most companies, especially during the experimentation phase. Google um, Maps APIs are free. You can, Google pays, by the way, a huge amount of money in getting satellite image, and it's available to the developer community for free. And, and I don't think anybody in Google has any regret about opening up APIs for Maps. The amount of usage is so high, it's uh, making it available on, you find Google Maps embedded in all sorts of different websites, and clearly Google makes more, no revenue from that. But pervasiveness of such application indirectly increases user happiness, users spend more time on the web, <coughs> and that's good for Google. And for app engine, where are we supporting? Uh, Folks, uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Uh, this is the last question. We are really running short of time. So I appreciate uh, if we can take it offline. We have a forum set up on uh, bangalorejitak.org. So you could actually post your questions, and we'll have to kind of answer them. Sure. So I'll take just one last question, and then step out. I think he started first, so let me just. OK. Now it's only supporting PHP, Python, all that, right? Uh, when are you guys supporting other languages? Uh, I think the roadmap is something that I may not be able to speak for accurately. But uh, uh, I'm sorry? Uh, that's something I cannot speak for. Uh, usually, uh, for a lot of things, what you find in public press is the only thing I can I can talk about. Great. Thank you very much, folks. It's been very nice to interact with you. And, uh, it's nice to see such an energetic group for GTAG inauguration. And all the best. Thank you.